Hello, and welcome to the Two Gals in a Mic podcast. I'm your host, Sue Curver, and on today's show, I'm sitting down with Sabrina Hannon, who is a seasoned therapist helping people create what they want in life in a sustainable and practical way. With the belief that we all have the ability to heal ourselves and rewire our brains, Sabrina is on a quest to help us understand that we all have what we need to heal, to bloom, and to thrive. Sabrina, welcome to the show. Hi, Sue. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. I want to start by talking a little bit about your journey to becoming a therapist, because you didn't start out as one. As a matter of fact, for over 20 years, you were contracted as a behavioral analyst to work with federal law enforcement. What was that like? I'm on the autism spectrum, and I'm also ADD, and I did really well in undergraduate school because I worked very, very hard. I didn't do anything other than study, but I realized that if I was going to go to graduate school, it would have to be in a field that was easy for me because I have two learning disabilities, and the combination of all of that neurodivergence makes learning and performing academically very, very challenging. So my graduate program was in applied behavioral science. But in the last part of my senior year, one of my dorm mates lost her life to her boyfriend. And I had been observing that he was stalking her and harming her. I talked to the dorm mom and I talked to the dean and it didn't go anywhere. I was awakened in the middle of the night because I saw the red and blue lights on my ceiling. I just walked out there and found somebody and I said, I know who did this and I can tell you what happened because he's been doing this for a while. That sergeant had a friend that worked at the FBI and said, you know, you ought to be profiled and see if you have what they like because you have some natural skills. A lot of people from the college I was going to end up in federal law enforcement. So it wasn't unusual, but what I wanted from that profile was to understand why I was so different because back in the eighties, nobody would have walked up to me from the faculty and said, Sabrina, you're learning disabled, you're ADD and you have autism. We need to help you. So I thought, well, maybe because this agency is so advanced that I might learn something. And I did. I learned a lot. The things that the profiler said to me have all come true. He said, you will function very well in this very narrow lane and you will not function in these other areas. So I paid attention to that. I've done a lot of things in my life. And over time, I've learned what resonates with me more, what was sustainable. And what I liked about working with law enforcement as a BA was that it was transactional. It's like, I'll do this for you if you do that for me. And it was very clear and defined. So you did the profile and then you got picked up by the FBI? Well, I want to be clear that I was a contractor. I was never an agent. The profiler defined my skills, and there's a very narrow place for contractors with this skill set working as contractors to the FBI. I was tested for 18 months in the sense of, we'll write down a situation for you and not give you all the information, and we want you to flesh it out, see if you can use your skills to demonstrate you understand what's happening between these people in this situation and what you think the outcome is going to be and what might have been the precursors. That's a very unique set of skills. And I'm an expert at that. After proving myself, I was invited onto a team. What my role was, was to help the survivors that we recovered from sex trafficking or kidnap and or ransom. I learned quickly that I have an extraordinary set of skills to work with people who are severely traumatized. And so that was my role. You know, they called me a BA, but in reality, I was just a person there to help recover the person and transfer them from the scene to where they could be cared for an inpatient and then from support them to go back to their families and support their families in that transition. Do you have a story that you can share that maybe has stuck with you or that really stands out to you from that time? There's one experience I had that just lives with me today to day. And I'm not really sure why. I've I've worked EMDR with it and I've worked with two trauma therapists over the many decades. It just stays with me and I'm just accepting of that now. The short version is that there was a very 
she was 14 at the time, very precocious physically and intellectually. So she presented as someone who was in her 20s and could carry it off. She was kidnapped for ransom. Her parents were famous people where they lived, and they initially refused assistance from the FBI. But when they received a video of her, they realized that this was much more serious than they could handle. I was on a team, we were called in, and really what they were trying to do was just get the money, but they became aware of the fact that they were not going to get away with it, and then they started to hurt her. They would speak to the parents every night at a certain time, and they demonstrated that they were destroying their daughter because they wanted more money. You know, a lot of people were involved in trying to resolve this situation. What I did was stand in the background and look at her because they put her in front of the camera. And eventually she found me in the background behind all the men. And she started to focus on me, which is what I wanted her to do, to attach to me, to identify with me as a young woman. Because I felt that if that was possible, she might retain her psyche and wouldn't dissociate and decompensate to where we couldn't recover her. She needed to attach to someone to survive what she was undergoing. And then we started writing each other notes. I'd hold up a note for her and she'd hold up a note for me. And eventually she was recovered. And I worked with her for a little over four years and her family. And that taught me that basically everything is about attachment. She recovered, but her body didn't recover. She suffered a lot of injuries that didn't heal, and she lost her life to her body's inability to heal her. That sounds so tragic, but that is why I became a therapist, because it became apparent to me that I can help people attach to me safely and then decide for themselves what they want. But I did a lot of really interesting things um, as part of this team. I have so much respect and admiration for the people that I met and the lieutenant and sergeant that I worked under and my teammates. It was the most profound experience to work with people who were highest performing and highest willingness. Even though what we were doing was so difficult, they were so very highly motivated. That really helped me develop as a young person. You just said that you found that everything is about attachment. Do you think that this is the most profound thing that you learned? How is that translated now into the work that you do? I spent time applying it to myself because as a child who grew up without what she needed and a lot of chaos and violence in the environment at home, as an autistic child, I couldn't find a way to make sense of my experience and I couldn't find an appropriate attachment to anyone. For people who are neurodivergent, it's extremely important to have an appropriate attachment that's sustainable, particularly in the developmental stages. The lack of that for me became very apparent when my colleagues and my lieutenant and my sergeant became my family and the persons I attached to. You know, there's a lot of theories about mental health and overall well-being out there. And I think they all are valid avenues because they start from somewhere and they approach secure attachment. This is my 23rd year working with people who are want to change their lives. And I really resonate with an internal family systems approach. I just achieved my certification at level one. That was a struggle for me, but I had learned to attach to myself, and so I succeeded. And I also am certified in interpersonal neurobiology with Dr. Siegel, which I think is extraordinarily important in our current world. Let's talk about this internal family system that you just mentioned. What is that? What does that mean, and why is it important? Humans are social beings. We learn to be in groups so that we could survive better. Our brain is wired for social connection, literally. And if you don't get those social needs met in the way that resonates with you, then you create strategies to help yourself. And some of those strategies don't work very well. And some of them are destructive. And some of them cause us to have physical, psychological, emotional, spiritual symptoms because we're not in resonance with ourselves. We need to find ways to connect with others. And that's why I say attachment is the source of our well-being. In the internal family systems approach, the first attachment is to yourself. Dr. Schwartz, who started this in 1990s, wrote a book that said, the person you are waiting for, I think it's what it's called. And the person you're waiting for is yourself. 
so we have attachments that are external to us, which are important, but we need over time to learn to attach to ourselves. How were you introduced to this methodology? Because it seems like it's very connected to your work as a behavioral analyst. There's a lot of congruency there, but I'm curious to know your journey to actually having an aha moment where you're like, hey, there's a methodology that aligns with my belief of secure attachment. Well, I found out by accident. I was talking to Dr. Siegel and he mentioned working with Dr. Schwartz. And I was like, who's that? So I looked him up and I was like, oh, wow. And I started listening to his books. I've listened to all his books and I've attended six trainings. I've gotten the materials and looked at them and explored the videos on YouTube. It's not a perfect structure or methodology, but it is the most resonant with what I've learned about how to help people. Because most people who are trafficked develop personas that they use to defend and protect themselves. And oftentimes it's considered psychotic or And there's some debate about this, but multiple personality disorder, the way that IFS looks at this, which is the way that I looked at it, is that persona is protecting that person, keeping them alive. And it's pertinent to the structure of their environment. It just made so much sense to me. It still just is very basic good sense to me that, you know, it resonates with me. I have a whole family system inside of me like every other person. And then I have a system of people outside of me, but the ones that are most important are the ones that are in here because I have to live with them all the time. I want to go back to something that I said in my intro, which is something that you have said, and that is that you believe that we all have what is needed to heal and to blossom and to thrive, and that we can actually work to rewire our brains. So Mm -hmm. explain this a little bit more. What do you mean by that? Where does this belief system come from? And honestly, how does this work? That's the work of uh, Dr. Siegel and in interpersonal neurobiology. It's well accepted now that your brain is plastic until the day you leave your body. And it used to be that you got to X age and your brain started to die, right? It's not true. What is true is that what I focus on builds pathways in my brain. So if I focus on noticing that I don't feel in alignment with my environment, then my brain starts to say, this isn't working. And then let's say I go to fly fishing school and suddenly realize that Montana is where I need to live like you did. And then your brain focuses on that and it wires in that direction. And so what we focus on creates wiring. And that's why for some people doing meditation is so healing and soothing. It calms the nervous system because you're focusing on being quiet and just being with yourself. It's really beneficial to decide where you want to put your focus. You know, this concept was explored in the fifties, right? This isn't new, but what is new is that you can wire your brain by focusing. Emotions are energy and motion. And so if I get angry when I'm talking to Nancy, I need to ask myself, why is this energy in motion in the form of anger? What is going on there? And the first place I look is here, right? Not out there, here. Because it's this relationship with myself that matters the most. And if I'm balanced in my relationship with myself, I'll have the best resonance possible with Nancy. Maybe it's only small, maybe it's big but it's still in alignment with myself. I love what you just said, where you said that we get to decide where we want to put our focus. Because I'm not sure that we always consciously think about Uh, that. We live in a world full of social media. We live in a world full of platforms that make us believe that we are not enough or that we have to do more or we have to be more. And we live in a world where it's easy for I call them keyboard warriors to really just be unkind. Any advice for ways that we can create environments that are more empathetic and more validating? I saw something on a post today. It said the best thing that we can do for ourselves as women in particular is set boundaries. 
that's what that is. If I want to create a world where my best friend's granddaughter doesn't have to suffer the way that I did when I was a girl, then the best thing I can do is model good boundaries. So if that tween sees me out at dinner and a man is rude to me and I turn around and be clear about my boundaries and clear that there's a threat behind it, so you've got a choice here. That is a really good example of what I mean. If women and everyone were clear about what is healthy for them and they kept that boundary, what you're desiring or perceiving as a better world would manifest itself. And that's very idealistic and magical thinking, but that is actually the direction we need to go. You're right. The world that has been developed in the last 200 years since the revolution of machines is about out there, right? The machine is making things that make us want things that it made, to be very simplistic. Where we are now is that tweens are in extreme danger for self-harm and suicide because they're constantly be exposed to the concept that they're less than. It's in comparison to someone else, and it's a fantasy. That which they're comparing themselves to is not reality. What I encourage my clients to do is enjoy those things as part of their life, but not as a definition of their life. So if we want to have that grand vision that you're talking about, we need to start here and create good boundaries and then balance what we do out there. I spend more time riding my horse than I do on my phone. And that's what works for me. You know, I've talked to a lot of people about boundary setting. And I think that Really part of creating boundaries lies in having psychological safety. And I know that psychological safety is a very important part of your practice. So tell us a little bit about how you foster an environment of trust and security. That's my training in IFS. I think IFS has extraordinarily honed my ability to help couples and families and individuals find safety inside of themselves. So the job of the IFS therapist, as defined by the Institute, is that I'm a consultant to the authentic self, building relationship with the parts that are inside of me. And that's how we create sustainable safety. The authentic self is in relationship to all of those parts, and it creates safety internally. Is it your experience that people who have created sustainable safety can be bolder or can be more fearless or can move into manifesting or creating a life that they want because they're anchored? The motivation comes from inside. There's that boundary. Is it because my great-grandmother told me I had to do this? Is it because my professor told me that I had to do this? Is it because I just learned I can make a lot of money doing this? Or is it because I can tell in my gut, in my chest, in my neck that this feels great? This is sustainable and it's healthy for me. That's how that's created. If I'm in a place where I trust myself, then I will do those things. I'll say maybe I should move from Pagosa Springs, where I was living before I came here, to a very rural and remote, undeveloped blip on a very small highway and really live out my Western life because I'm a Western girl. I was born in Durango with a cattle ranch next door, and my older two siblings rode their horses down to the bus stop and left their horses in the pasture there. That rural life is what resonates with me, and having the confidence to make that happen is because I have the motivation inside of myself that comes from my ability of my authentic self to relate to all my parts. That's really deep, but I think but it's really important. It's fascinating as I'm sitting here listening to it. And I, and I love that you have connected the dots for us in talking about what brought you to Montana and, and the reason why it's important for you to live a rural lifestyle. And part of this, as you've already mentioned, is it also gives you the ability to play. So it gives you yeah. the ability to get out on your horses and ride the trails and be with your dogs. I'm curious to know, your methods of success for finding time 
and maybe courage because some of us don't have the courage to step away from responsibilities in order to create that balance and to have fun on a daily basis. How do you do that? And I think the question you're asking is related and correlated to the question you asked before about how do we manifest what's right for us? How do we have the courage and the motivation and the will to take that picture we have and make it concrete? There's the authentic self telling the parts that we can do this. Let's all work together and benefit the whole system. I love that. It really is a sum of all parts. It sounds like the authentic self has to be the leader, the ringleader for the sum of all parts. And if you're not in alignment with authentic self, then you're not going to be in alignment with what you are supposed to be doing in life. And we've talked a lot about that in the podcast. You know, different women have talked a lot about how they have found alignment, what it means to be Mm -hmm. in alignment, how to manifest the right kind of life for yourself. And the, the other subject that keeps coming up is this idea about saying yes to an open door, even when that doesn't necessarily make sense. Do you have a door that stands out for you? Something that you said yes to that maybe stretched you or scared you or asked you to be better than you thought you could be? Yeah, I had a lot of those when I was working with my team. My lieutenant was particularly adept at saying, you're doing this because he saw my potential. And as an autistic person, I don't necessarily see my potential. I don't have that kind of type of self-awareness, but he saw it and he said, you're, do- you're doing this. I'd say 80% of the time I was fearful of what it meant to actually do that. I was very badly injured in 2000. I was hit by a drunk driver. When I went from being in the wheelchair to being in the walker, I was terrified because I had been flat and then I had been sitting and being upright seemed like a prescription for hell because you fall farther and it hurts more. So that was the biggest challenge that I had was deciding that I could actually be upright and that I could actually regain a fair amount of what I had lost physically so that I could function independently. The authentic self inside of me said, you know, Just look at everything you've already accomplished in your life that was scary. Fear isn't the issue here. It's the unknown, a loss of control. For me, that's what it is. That loss of control is manageable because my other parts can come together and make that work with the leadership of the authentic self. How does one find the authentic self? I mean, it it seems like a very esoteric idea, right? Practically, how do you do that? And I think if we look at this concept from the spiritual or religious traditions, it's your soul, it's your spirit, it's your core. And if we look at it from Western psychological traditions, it could be called your ego. You're born with it. You came into the world with it. It's immutable. You can't lose it. Nobody can harm it or take it away from you. And you can't give it away. You remember the story I told you about the girl and she and I started writing notes to each other like this, what I was doing was reminding her that she had that person inside of her that nobody could do anything to. And I did it totally intuitively. If I come into the world with this immutable self, core self, and I, and whatever word works for the people that are listening to identify that, that's okay, right? It doesn't have to be my words. If I show up with that and nobody can do anything to it or take it away from me, then I have an inherited wisdom and knowing in that authentic self. And we see it in children. Um, They show up with this knowledge and this awareness and this sensibility that children technically aren't supposed to have, but there's that authentic self showing up in the child. I've met a few small children that were so cunning and canny and strategic that they undid their captors. I'm amazed by that. And it reminds me that that core self is there. And then I meet particularly women who've lived very, very difficult lives and have decided how they want to form their own life instead of let's letting someone else form it. There's that authentic self. I've worked with people in the intelligence community and the military who've decided that this is not for me. 
and I'm going to sell everything and buy a red Corvette and drive to South America and buy a bar and be a bartender. And I'm like, dude, cool. Because their whole thing is I want to be warm. I want to be in the sun. I want the sand. I want a social life and I want to be free. There's your spirit talking. It's there. It shows up. If we pay attention, we'll see it in others. And I think that we've already said it really to live in authenticity is a courageous thing to do because it's all these things that we've been talking about. It's putting up these boundaries for yourself. It's really tapping into the internal wisdom, that knowingness of what you want and what motivates you and what makes you tick. But I think the most courageous thing that you can do is to do that daily. So what do you feel daily steps of courage look like? giving yourself time to really understand what you're experiencing. We live in an extremely fast-paced world. There's this piece that gets lost in our culture, which is, I need time to do this. I need time to process this. I need time to just sit with this. And I need time to make this decision. And oftentimes, we don't give that to ourselves. Our authentic self has this wisdom but it has to be integrated with your other parts and it has to have time to show up and guide you. And if we're rushing or we're responding to other person's pressure, we're not connected to our authentic self. We're externally focused. It's important to remember that if you can, give yourself a moment. Sabrina, when you look back on all of the things that you've done and you've had a phenomenal life, what's the thing or maybe a couple of things that you feel you're going to be the most proud of? And what is your best advice for living life with no regrets? What I'm most proud of is my ability to sit with that girl who's been harmed for days and just look in her eyes and hold her hand and say, I'm here for you. And I know you're hurting and this is wrong and watch her leave. I have this extraordinary ability to be present. I mean, I can hear the men behind me sobbing and and I'm not moved to sob. I'm moved to attach because I want her or him or they to know that they're attached as they leave, that it's okay. That's so important. And I've done that with my animals and I've done that with the veterans that I've worked with. And I'm going to keep doing that. It's part of my authentic self. I think regret comes from a dissonance between the authentic self and the environment that we find ourselves in. Regret is that dissonance between your authentic self and what happens in our context. We only have so much control over that external context. Sabrina, is there anything that I didn't ask about that you wanted to share or talk about? The love that I have for my animals. For many years, I have had wolf hybrids, you know, animals that other people have thrown off or were going to be euthanized because they were dangerous and had done quote unquote bad things. And I just do so beautifully with them, huskies and malamutes and shepherds. And my horses are the center point of my life. I moved here so that I could have my horses that it's like could ride out from my house year round and so that I could ride in Yellowstone, and so I could go to Grand Tetons, because riding in the Tetons is the pinnacle experience for me. It brings everything into alignment. I also want to say that I am so very grateful to my late husband, who showed me how much is possible in relationship, and I hope for other women that they find a person like that in their life. It doesn't have to be their partner, but that they find a person like that in their life. Well, thank you, Sabrina, for sharing your insights with all of us. The work that you're doing to help people heal and to honor themselves is really critical in this time when there is so much divisiveness in the world. So thank you for sharing your love and light. It's so amazing. And thank you listeners for tuning in. The podcast would not be possible without your support. So be sure to share with a friend and then tune in again next week for another amazing conversation on Two Gals and a Mic. I'll see you then.